Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lisa Curtis from uh, De-Risk Advisory Services. Um, the very short plug um, on the organization before I get into the content. De-Risk was set up to solve a problem of, um, if you like, the arbitrage between the real risk and the perceived risk of investing in, different, in difficult environments. What we focus on is risk mitigation for investors in frontier markets and in frontier asset classes. Now this came about because of some experience that I've had which is relevant to this presentation. For the last four years I've been periodically helping DFID set up private sector programs in a number of countries, all of which happen to have been post-conflict. So initially in Sierra Leone, then in Kosovo, very briefly in Iraq, which is not quite post-conflict in my opinion, um, and now currently in Nepal. So what I have to share with you today is based on my experiences of looking at how to promote private sector growth, how to promote private sector investment in a range of post-conflict countries, um, some of which may be on the edge of dipping back into conflict. Um, and from my own perspective, how to make investment safe and attractive in those sorts of markets. So let me share some thoughts with you. First of all, some truisms. Um, what do you find when you go into a conflict-affected country? And again, I have to classify, clarify. My perspective is mainly on places that have emerged from conflict, though some of this is clearly also true from places that are still in conflict, but in that respect, Diane and I are talking on slightly different subjects. First of all, everything's broken. Institutions, infrastructure. More importantly, nothing really works and most people who are in charge of making things work probably don't realize what it is that's required, have no memory of how it was when it used to work, they don't know how to fix things. Um, then there's a question of priorities. You need to fix everything before you can fix everything else, and let me explain. Um, infrastructure. Almost always infrastructure is what's most damaged. Power, transport, the key things that you need to build a functioning economy tend to be the things that are most broken in a conflict or a post-conflict environment. And those are the things that take longest to fix, are most expensive to fix, and are the hardest to fix. So, catch-22. Um, from the perspective of a private sector investor, how sure are you that you're going to get your money out? Or that your money's going to even get to work, let alone be able to take it out? And then there's the culture of business in, com in places that have had conflict for a long time, and Diane also alluded to this. Um, you function under the radar. Uh, the rules don't really apply. It's possible to make a great deal of money in a conflict environment, usually by circumventing the rules. Um, contraband fl flourishes. Um, you have you know, grey markets. Currency does very strange things with its values. And the people who learn how to survive and make money in those sorts of environments are people who know how to invest and get their money out quickly. They know how to make decisions very quickly and they know how to change their business models overnight. Now if that goes on for any length of time, that becomes the only way that people know how to do business. And changing that is a very important mindset shift that needs to be taken into account if you're thinking of investing for the long term. Two examples that I wanted to highlight in terms of challenges of doing business in conflict-affected environments. And I'm not going to go through these. I think most of you are probably familiar with the doing business rankings. But just to comment on what this kind of benchmarking can and can't tell you from the perspective of an investor. Nepal, 121 out of, what is it, 165 in 2009 in the, in the entire list. So, you know, middle bottom. Sierra Leone, no longer the bottom. Yeah. Um, what's interesting, from the perspective of businesses that have been trying to operate in those two markets in the last three years, is I could tell you that Sierra Leone is probably a much easier place to do business than Nepal is. What that's telling you about are the formal rules. What that tells you about is a relative ranking based on the rules that are known, the rules as they are applied, and, if you like, the way one would like things to be when compared with Singapore. 
But actually on the ground, a lot of things work far better than they seem. And this, I think, is a very important point for businesses that are operating, and I think the view is all about this. Um, you know, quite often, a place that has a parlous reputation may actually not be a bad place at all, as long as you're paying attention to how things really work. And this brings up a point which was raised in the briefing for this, for this event, which is, how on earth do you get hold of the right information? If this kind of information is the type which is most easily accessible from a distance, where do you get hold of reliable information to tell you what you can invest in and how you're going to protect your investment if you're not actually immersed in the middle of a very difficult place? So some thoughts on that. Um, first of all, if the rules and the procedures and the way of setting up a business or operating a business um, are not clear, they've been improperly codified, they're anachronistic, um, they're discretionary, you know, how do you figure out how to do the right thing and not get yourself into more trouble? Um, you know, how do you get the information, a point that I've already made? But more importantly, how do you decide what's really broken and what simply requires you to navigate the processes slightly differently? And I think what's worth noting here, and I think this is very much the case in the conflict environment as well, is that aligning yourself with the people who want to make things better and being part of the process that improves governance, that improves transparency, that improves the way that things work, will create a better climate for your business as you're making your business happen. This all sounds platitudinous, so I'm not going to spend too much time repeating that. But think of the upside from a business's perspective. Having taken the time to work alongside reformers, to work alongside the people who are trying to create peace, um, having taken the risk and, and, and made the investment, the investment of time, though not necessarily of money in the initial stages, investors who are willing to go to those sorts of environments are going to have markets all to themselves, the early mover advantage. Um, and without creating an anti-competitive framework, having the first mover advantage means basically you have everything to play for while everybody else figures out that it's a good business to be in. Um, and again, I'm sure that there are many of you who know all about this. So, self-help. What can you do as a business without relying on government protection, without relying on special favors? Well, actually you can do quite a lot. So to twist the old adage of knowledge is power, I would argue knowledge is security. Operating in a country where everything is unstable and nobody's really quite sure what's going on or what's really going to work, know the rules better than the people who are administrating the rules and help them look good while they're doing their day job, rather than find a way, finding a way of circumventing them or supporting them when they suggest that you should be trying to circumvent them. Um, you make yourself one of the good guys. You make yourself one of the fixers. Understanding the reformers and what they want to achieve. And this requires a little bit of insight, because at the top level, you know, most reformers are going to say, we want more tax revenues. Well, that's great, but that gives you no information at all. How are you going to get those tax revenues in the long term? Let me give you the example, Sierra Leone, where in a fit of enthusiasm about um, an explosion of the bubble in commodity prices, about two years ago, there was a huge increase in rice prices. And there was an enormous enthusiasm on the part of policymakers to promote investment in domestic rice growing. It doesn't matter what you think, what your opinion is of the merits or demerits of, of growing this crop in Sierra Leone. The point is that as an investor, you're suddenly faced with, a, in, you know, with a, an opportunity to think of the support infrastructure that would make that policy initiative possible. Think of the warehousing that wasn't there. Think of all the, the infrastructure that was broken. Think of all of the markets that can be made to function on the back of a, a genuine commercial investment because there is a policymaker who wants to make something happen. 
That kind of creative thinking creates market opportunities, creates investment opportunities that are not the, uh, the obvious ones. As an investor in this type of environment, you're not going to see those opportunities unless you're thinking through what development objectives are and what reformers' objectives are just as much as you're thinking through business opportunities. And if you can think of those things in alignment, then the investment opportunities can be quite large. And so to follow up again, this is a point that Diana made about political economy. It matters who you hire, where you go for jobs. Transparency, as you, as, as you were saying, in the recruitment process is not sufficient. Outreach is probably what you have to do more of to make sure you get the right people. Why did the conflict happen in the first place? In Nepal, it's very clear that the conflict happened because income inequality that was getting worse and worse. Anybody who goes into that country now to invest that does not address this income inequality is going to find themselves contributing to the causes of instability and chances are we're going to slip back into conflict again. Don't be part of the problem. Um, and so I come back to this point about building the long-term business case. Good business and commercial returns are actually going to be far more sustainable, far better for building the peace, I would argue, than charitable works. So a school or a clinic, which are, if you like, a nice addition to some industrial operation, are going to probably have less that lasting value in terms of that business's license to operate than an investment in strengthening the supply chain and making sure that more businesses are able to become domestic suppliers and having a much wider network of people in employment because you are in business. Thinking about those supply chain linkages, thinking about bringing in the economic net in the hinterland of whatever the business is, is probably going to make more friends in the long term than providing a school or a clinic for just the employees of that business. Not always a popular thing to say, but I believe it quite strongly. Um, I don't want to dwell too long. Talked about self-help, outside help. Um, there is a lot of it, and this is again something that in, a diff in, in frontier markets, in conflict environments, there is actually an awful lot of outside help. A number of new facilities have been created over the last years by multi-donor programs, there is the private infrastructure development group, again, primarily, exclusively for infrastructure, but a range of facilities that can help investors. Similarly, investment plan facility for Africa, all of these, the information is publicly easily available, so I'm not going to talk about them very much. Likewise, the bilateral donor programs, but from the perspective of an investor in a difficult environment, and coming back to the point about information and knowledge, these guys are not the bad guys, even though they may be slow, bureaucratic, and the rules are just horrendous. But they can really help. They can be part of facilities that can take some of the management burden away, in terms of finding financial resources, in terms of finding local human resources. Not because that's what they think they're doing, but because they are major repositories of useful information. Very good to get close to them. Fine. And they're not all the same in each country. Um, and sometimes they're, they're doing really, really good stuff, which is what they intend to do as well. <laughs> so, I'm going to wrap up there. Um, and just to finish up, I think, you know, there is, to reiterate, a lot of opportunities, not very easy, difficult environment to work in, not for the faint-hearted, but actually, well thought out businesses have been hugely important in consolidating the peace in, in a number of different places, and there's many examples of that. And for what there isn't outside help, there's always insurance. Thank you. <laughs>
after the conflict, with all of the cost problems they had in, in dealing with such a difficult environment, um, it turned out to be better business to be growing sorghum locally than importing barley from neighboring countries and changing the formulation of what they were brewing. Um, a whole system of initially quite expensive outgrower support systems to get local farmers to start producing sorghum, a retooling of the plant in order to be able to process it, the indirect employment that was created over, I think, three years as a, as a result of this process. The brewery probably only employs 200 people directly, and they estimate in their entire supply chain they've created 7,000 jobs. And a lot of very happy suppliers and some even happier customers because the beer now gets everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh,